one, two, test, test. Good evening, everyone. Sorry that I was running a little late due to the world. Act of God. But God is good all the time, right? He brought us some rain, so make sure that everything turned green. Uh, I am Tim Al Atkin, Dallas City Council member. Uh, I am the chair of economic development for the city of Dallas and also chair of housing. I wear a double hat. Um, some of I city staff were running late due to the weather. Uh, they did not figure out the time and the traffic coming south. So we do have congestion traffic coming south. So we do have a traffic problem. Um, I know we got Michael Rogers over there, a new person in charge of transportation there. Where you hand, Mike? He's the director of transportation. Uh, we got Corey Poole over there, economic de development person there. And my staff, Maria Salazar Hello. and Kendra there. Uh, we'll get started. You know, sorry we're running late. Uh, we sit here at Redbird Mall slash Southwest Summer Mall. And everyone is wondering why we're here today. How many people raise your hand if you was here in 1974, raise your hand. Okay. How many people was not here in 1974? Raise your hand. Now we talk about institution knowledge, and that's what we need. You always think about your grandmother, your great great parents, and said, "What happened? Who was your great grandmother or your great grandfather? Tell me the story. Tell me what happened." in the neighborhood, what happened in the community. If you do not have that institution knowledge, you never know what happened. Back in 1974, this mall was created, Redbird Mall. And the people who created this mall was not from Dallas. They were from where? The West Coast. California. A company, a guy who owned a NFL football team, the Dabalos, the, the 49ers. He came here with a dream and with a vision and said that we need something different. He saw an opportunity. When he came here, he did not ask the city of Dallas for nothing. He did not ask the community for anything. He just came and built and saw the opportunity to make money. And we, the community and the citizens of Dallas, we came here and we shop at this great mall. We shop, we had jobs, we work in the neighborhood, we did everything that we should have done in 1974 and 1975. Now, Let's go back to current stakeholders. We got Sears is still here. Burlington Factory is here, which was old Montgomery Ward building. Next slide. Then we turn around and look at what happened the next day. The J.C. Penney's building was here, which was on the west side, which is no longer is here now. Do you look at the Macy's building was sold in 2017? It's no longer here. Do you look at the Dillers building, which was here, which was a company called tried to do a developer called Fiesta for, for, for Mundo, a concept, an entertainment to come to the mall. They failed, they failed bankruptcy. Now they're no longer here. Now you got a J.C. Penney's building that is not here. You got a Dillon's building, which is here, is standing. But when we did that, when I came along in 2007, I said, what is going on with this mall? Ms. Pimmerson was here. The trash will pile up. The lights gonna get cut off. And we said, what should we do? 
Miss Pimsa called me. I was leaving, going to Hawaii with my white linen suit on. You still owe me a, a suit, Miss Pimsa. <laughs> and she said, they finna cut the lights off of this mall. I said, what? I said, you go and stand by the power and don't move and let me call the city manager because we cut those lights off what happened it's hard to get the lights back on so she stood by there to make sure the lights were not cut off and we called the city sanitation to pick up all the trash to make sure it was clean to make sure this mall stayed there then we said, what should we do? First thing you do anything, you do a study, right? And we said, let's do a study, which we went and hired the ULI, the Urban Land Institution. We want to hire somebody the best in the country. And they came here to the community, and they said, this is a great asset. Next slide. And you look at the inline stores here, which we got a police front, which is great, and thank DPD for what they're doing. Next slide. Then we started looking at the Southern Dollar Task Force with the Urban Land Institution and said, how do we figure this out? So we start with a task force with 275 volunteers. And I asked them, will you stay a course for 24 months? And they stayed a course for 24 months. Tell us what is wrong, not with River Mall, but without the whole city of Dallas. And this was one of the parts of the area they picked, the Southwest Center Mall. The team worked together, which I was a chair of. When we spent over hundred thousand dollars, we had twenty meetings, and they came out and said, "Just like going to a barbecue, okay? You take your steak to the barbecue, right? This mall was just like a barbecue. You forgot to take the steak to the barbecue, or you left the steak on the grill too long, they burn up, and we did not watch the mall. They said this is a city." responsibility of the mall. And your next page slide. They said the mall for 20 years that went down and how you pull something back up. The study said that the only way that this mall will survive the market too weak for private investment. Redevelopment without public investment. In other words, they said way back then, this mall would not survive with private investors alone. It would take public investment to make sure this mall would work. That's the only way it will survive. The only way. And they also said there are too many different owners. You can look at the mall with 38 different owners and how you have a family that everyone go to the picnic and everybody want a hamburger and somebody want a hot dog and how you satisfy everybody wants. It's very difficult. So you have someone got to be in charge but 30 different owners, everybody said, I own this piece of dirt. I in charge my own piece of dirt. So you can't tell me what to do because this is what I own. So they said you have to come in to acquire property. You got to do acquisition. Then they said you have to have a vision. Next slide. And this vision, they said, you got to start buying or uh, acquire property. So when we did a UNI study, the first thing they said that you got a J.C. Penney's building over there that torn down. You, the city, need to acquire that piece of property. So we put an option to acquire the property, but we did not acquire it. But the study said we should store and acquire property to do acquisition to make sure we had development, to make sure that we had not fragment, but make sure that we had all these different parcels together in order to grow. 
They say the ship should play an active role in land or something. Ownership and gain control of the site. You got to gain control of the site. They say the shield should establish a tip. And the first tip we ever established that David Cox is going to say that. Now, Courtney is going to talk about the tip that we started way back at Thomason Hall, uptown, city place. American Airlines some all these great places downtown where all these tips started. That also got to be community-based vision. You got to have the vision from the community. You got to listen to the community. You got to have those visions. If the community is not part of the vision, if the community is not part of the deal, it's not going to work. And why by saying that, I want to thank for Friendship West. I think we got some people from Friendship West. Java Christian College is here. Concord, Antioch, Ibach, Oak Cliff Bible, Miss Pendleton, the Redbird, all those different organizations here is part of the community. And they support this, and I support this, dear Harley. I support it one reason. I've been living in the same neighborhood for over 50 years. I can walk to the mall. So this is passion to me. This mall is very passionate to me. And I want to be able to walk to the mall and walk back to have a walkable neighborhood. To do that, we have a great community meeting tonight. But this meeting also about change the zoning. The study said that you just cannot just have a mall here without changing the zoning. Right now, you can build anything on this mall, but you cannot build apartments. So, they said you need to do a mixed use. The mixed use would bring in apartment market rate, so therefore you can live, eat, work, entertainment, and walk up a neighborhood. You can keep your money where in your neighborhood, the money, the money can turn more than once, twice, three, four, maybe five times in the neighborhood to have a walk up a neighborhood to do that. So with that, fast forward, and we're gonna bring in Courtney, come up. This is our Director of Economic Development. And we're going to talk about TIP. We're going to talk, talk about the, the tools that we need to make sure this model is going to be a success. So, on mark, mark this calendar down on February the 28th, out for 1 p.m. on February the 28th, this model will come up to be rezoned. And listen to the reason why it needs to be rezoned and the reason why. And the reason why is two things, the reason why. Number one, the UNR study said it need to be a mixed use development. Number two, it said you got to have community input. You got to have community input and community need to know about TIP and what the tools in the toolbox, what take place when you try to do major development. And with that, on that coordinate, to come up with his slides and follow him would be the bond fund. Then we're going to have zoning with David Costa, going to tell you about the zoning. Then after David Costa, we're going to have Richard Wagon, going to talk about the infrastructure. Then we're going to have Tech Stop, talking about the gateway. Then we'll have Peter Broxton talking about the vision of Redbird Mall. Okay, Courtney. Go back to follow. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Courtney Pogue. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the City of Dallas. I've been here for about 90 days, and <laughs> Councilmember Atkins has put me to work every day, 24-7. So, within my department, we oversee a number of programs and tools uh, from workforce development, which is overseen by Venus Cobb. Raise your hand, Venus. And um, a number of incentive tools we have in the department from our 108 program, to our TIP program, to new market tax credits, to our public-private partnership program, and various tax abatements. So, 
As we look at Redbird, one of the key tools as far as economic development in redevelopment of this mall is TIF, or we call tax government financing. So next slide. So the city of Dallas since 1988 has created a number of TIFs. Um, there are currently uh, 19 TIFs, of which uh, all 19 are active. We actually created 21 originally. Two are inactive, being State and Thomas and City Place. Uh, the reason why they're inactive is because they have lived, uh, they have done their purpose as far as TIF creation. We have created economic development, raised the tax base, and created jobs. Next slide. So, as we have TIFs in the city of Dallas, one of the ways in which we, or the tools in our toolbox is utilizing the property taxes to reinvest in certain areas. So, Redbird Mall is in the TIF district. And TIF is not a new tax, nor is an increase in property taxes, but it's really utilizing the increment as a project to stabilize and create it to go back into the area. The owners pay their taxes as usual. However, those taxes go back into the general fund for the city of Dallas. And as developers, in this case, Mr. Brodsky applies for TIF. He can only utilize increment generated by his project or from the TIF area. And in this case, we have a very unique TIF as it relates to the mall area TIF. And only if the developer completes the project and he does all the requirements as outlined with the city staff and city council members defining the actual contract with the developer, the project can move forward and receive TIF assistance. Next slide. So, and this model uh, basically outlines how TIF works. Uh, the red layer, the lower level, is basically the, the base taxes and which still go to funding uh, the various taxing bodies, being schools and other areas throughout the city. And the incremental value is basically the gold and the blue. In this case, the developer tax taps into the gold, and the blue still goes to the general fund. So TIF is simply a win-win here in the city of Dallas for increased property taxes as far as increment from the development, and it adds value to funding other programs throughout the city. So, um, the mall area TIF, like I said, I was saying, is a very unique TIF, being that it's in two distinct areas. There's a the northern portion, which covers Valley View Mall, and there's a the southern portion, which covers Redbird Mall. So, the northern portion is called Montfort, and that's roughly 173 acres, and the southern portion is Westmoreland, which is basically the Redbird Mall area. So this is a map that shows the northern portion of the TIF, uh, which is basically covering the Valley View Mall area. And that's a project which we're working on also. Um, the next slide. And the southern portion, uh, which covers Redbird Mall. So this is more or less, we have a TIF that covers two distinct areas in which they actually support one another. However, the unique caveat here, next slide, within the funding structure or the actual TIF allocation policy, a portion of the increment from the northern area being around Valley View, 10% of the increment will come to support the Redbird Mall area. As you see with the Redbird mall area allocation policy, uh, no increment is, is flowing back to the northern portion. So therefore, in this case, uh, we're getting additional increment for the project or project within the area from the northern sector uh, to support the redevelopment of Redbird Mall. One of the key items that we're pushing, uh, we did a market value analysis citywide you read about it last month in the paper, it was in the media, and this is really a policy of looking at investments throughout the city of Dallas as it relates to housing investments. And what we're focusing on is defining our housing policy and our economic development policy and transportation policy. Mr. Mike Rogers in the back. 
we're all working together to kind of really make sure we're allocating our resources within the various departments to focus on uh, development around the city. And as we look at our market value analysis, uh, that'll be the guiding principle of allocating those resources for investments throughout the city. Next slide. And looking at the gold and which are areas G, H, and I, uh, those are areas that require or require us to focus our attention as far as making investments. So with the Redbird Mall area, it's basically surrounded by um, areas F or G, H and I as far as the color coding. And that's where basically we're gonna focus our efforts as far as making investments around the city with our housing policy and our eco policy to make sure we're all aligned, to make sure we're supporting the projects defined by the community and the council members going forward. So we have received applications for uh, the two projects, um, Valley View Mall, and we received an uh, application from Mr. Brodsky for Redbird Mall um, to look at um, moving these projects forward. We're doing a thorough analysis in which they're required to provide a very detailed application in regards to the project. And as we move forward, uh, we'll provide updates via the council members in regards to the status of the project. in the bond program for the infrastructure for uh, improvements for the Redbird Mall, Redbird Mall area. Can you hold the mic? Oh, sorry. For the Redbird Mall improvements in, in, the, in the public right of way. Thus far, we haven't identified any projects yet, so therefore we haven't done much with this bond fund, but we still have the money and we can only use it in the public right of way. So once the projects have been identified, we'll be able to get started in, with these projects. David, what day is it? Awesome. You up? Hey, thank you to everybody that came out on a rainy night. Your participation in this process and, and kind of spurring development, because it really will take the whole community to push this thing forward and get the development that you want. I was a little slow finding the rain to get here, but I think I made it. So one of the first steps that was undertaken really was uh, putting zoning on the ground that basically vested the property with certain development rights. And in order to redevelop an area, it's important to have the, the development rights in place so a person interested in redeveloping the property can go raise money knowing that he's got entitlements to, uh, to some amount of development rights on a piece of property. Uh, today, the property is on regional retail, which is really just indicative of what it really is, designed for retail serving a region. Uh, it allows all types of retail, lodging, and personal service uses. It allows uh, some uses that you probably don't want to see a lot of when you're in the midst of redevelopment. We'll see those here in a second. The proposed zoning that they've come in and asked for is a mixed-use zoning classification we call MU2, uh, but this would allow them to develop a range of residential uses, whether it be uh, some quality multifamily uses, uh, possibly even townhouse-style uses in the future uh, to help support the retail, which is which is critical to, to making the area redevelop. Uh, does increase the height uh, in FAR, which is floor area ratio, it just determines how much building you can have on a particular piece of property. Uh, and again, does allow a, a range of residential uses uh, as part of the base MU2 zoning. Some of the uses uh, that are allowed in the, uh, that are not allowed in MU2 that were previously allowed in the regional retail, you can see some of the heavier commercial retail uses like maintenance shops, uh, machinery repair, um, boarding houses, the home improvement center, pawn shops, check cashing facilities, and vehicle display. Again, that could be anything from a new car lot to a used car lot. 
Uh, this is just a chart really indicating comparison between the development rights uh, between the regional retail and the MU2 zoning. As you can see, it would allow uh, more height up to 135 feet, which would typically be up to 10 stories. However, uh, for the residential community surrounding it, it's still subject to what we call our residential proximity slope. Uh, not that it would be impacted by that, but it still offers that type of protection within the district as well. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of the types of zoning allowed uh, in a comparison between what's there today and what's being requested. Um, again, as Mr. Councilman Atkins had, had indicated, the City Plan Commission recommended unanimously approval of this zoning case. Uh, it is now goes to City Council on the 28th. Um, certainly, if you need any additional information, please feel free to contact my office. I'll give you our phone number if you need it. It's 214-670-4127. Uh, certainly encourage that. But again, I think getting zoning on the ground to support the development that you that we all desire down here is, is part of the process. Um, the quality of development that you'll see will be governed to some extent by the relationship between the developer and the city as they seek our participation then we're able certainly to make sure that we end up with the quality that y'all really want to see happen here so that's kind of an extra layer protection uh, when we are participants in a particular project. So with that, Richard. Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Wagner. I'm the Assistant Director of uh, Capital Improvements for Dallas uh, Water Utilities. Um, the map in front of you represents uh, the water, wastewater, and storm sewer infrastructure that is currently at this site. Um, as you can see, the area is very well served um, with all three utilities. Um, the downside is, is that all that infrastructure was built back when the mall was developed in the 70s. So it's over 40 years old, needs to be replaced. Um, the good side of it is, is with the redevelopment that Mr. Brodsky and his team is working on, uh, the water and wastewater infrastructure will need to be relocated to support that development so we can kind of take care of two issues at one time, the development as well as replacing uh, the old infrastructure. Um, so to date, uh, the DW team has met with Mr. Brodsky and his team, including Kimley Horn, the engineer, for uh, the design of the water and wastewater improvements. Um, and we've already begun analyzing what the proposed plan is and then how that fits into what the infrastructure needs need to be. Um, so with that, we just uh, we look forward to working with his team and all of the rest of the stakeholders involved in the project uh, for a successful outcome. Thank you. The next presentation was someone for TxDOT. We we are talking about Southern Gateway, so I want to make sure that TxDOT get an update what's going on. But also, I want to thank uh, Pastor Carter from Concord in the house. Thank you, Pastor Carter, for showing up. It's great to have someone come to the house on Bible study. I know Wednesday night is a difficult night, but thank you for showing up. Good evening. I'm one of the project uh, deputy project managers for the Southern Gateway Project, and so I'd like to give you a broad overview about the project. And uh, we'll start off with the project uh, layout map to kind of give you an idea of where the project's located. It will start at the just south of downtown where the horseshoe project ended it's divided into two segments segment one being the 35 portion of the project and segment 2a being the 67 portion of the project it's about 10 miles total <coughs> segment one of the project will go from colorado boulevard down to the 67 split and that'll be full reconstruction that's about 5.1 miles It'll also fully reconstruct the 6735 interchange. We'll, we have the, today you have an existing eight lane uh, G, uh, general purpose lanes on the 35 section. We'll be doing full reconstruction of those general purpose lanes and you'll have 10 general purpose lanes when we're through. So that'll be five lanes each direction. 
We'll also be reconstructing the one existing HOV lane into two reversible non-tow managed lanes. The frontage roads will also be reconstructed and we'll also be building new frontage roads in this area. The, there will also be a, about a mile north of Colorado. We'll be able to convert the single HOV lane into the, into the dual, um, the dual uh, express managed lanes. On the 67 portion of the project, which is segment 2A, that will, that will uh, pick up at the north end where the full reconstruction ends at the 67 split at the, off of 35. On the segment 2A, we'll be uh, widening to a third lane. Today you have two lanes each direction, so when we're through, you'll have a third lane in each direction. We'll also be converting the two concurrent HOV lanes into a single reversible lane. This kind of gives you an idea of what the typical sections of both of those segments will look like. The top being segment one, which is the 35 portion of the project, which will be the full reconstruction section of the project. And it, you can see on the outside, you have your two uh, discontinuous frontage roads that will be fully reconstructed. You also have your five general purpose lanes that will build going each direction. And your two non-told uh, managed express lanes in the center there. On the lower, typical section is segment 2A. That'll be from, again, from 67 split off of 35 down to the uh, I-20 interchange. We'll be widening to the third lane. As you can tell, you have three lanes each direction now, and you'll have a single reversible non-towed express lane. So to get into a specific area near the mall here, here on the project, the six, this is a 67 portion. Next to Camp Wisdom, we will be adding a northbound exit to Camp Wisdom. That's what you can see there in the lower part on the, in the blue. So there will be a northbound exit off the northbound main lanes, and we'll also have a, a left turn lane at the intersection to help with access to the mall. This is our, our single... Um, on the 67 portion of the project, you have the single non-towed express lane. This will be your access point to get into that going north and to exit it going south. This will allow you to enter it from Camp Wisdom and to also exit going south to exit to Camp Wisdom. This is kind of a broad timeline of our project. We began, began design this past fall in 2017. We are, we'll be breaking ground this winter. Um, we've, we've been, uh, we're very deep into the design process right now. You should start to see some construction take place this winter. Um, this spring, we will be closing the HOV lanes so that we can, can do all our operations and construction. This summer, you'll see a lot of overpasses and bridges being rebuilt along the whole corridor. And in the next two years, you'll see a series of traffic switches and lane movements and for the different phases of the projects. And the full uh, project completion date will be at late 2021. These are some, this is some contact information for the project. We will have a website there at the top. This will describe any lane closures we'll be having. You'll be able to see how the project is progressing from this website. We'll also have contact information on the website. And these are two of our contacts. If you would like to take that information down, you'll be able to reach out to if you have any questions. You mentioned those gateways. Are in our community. That's why we are here to give everyone a open voice. An open voice. Any kind of information you need, please do not hesitate to call my office. And that's why I'm not doing all the presentation. Everyone doing their own presentation. So we're going to stick to the facts. No make-believe. The facts of how this community is operating and how we do build a business in our community. And, and one thing I want to say, number one, when this model first started in 1974, there was a company who came here from California, the Dabalos, the 49ers. They didn't ask this community for nothing. They came and built whatever they wanted. So now you got opportunity to participate in what is going on in your community now. 
Again, here is Mr. Brockers. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm very relieved that this worked. It did not work in the rehearsal yesterday, but uh, uh, technology gods are on our side today. Um, so first of all, I want to again, I want to thank Pastor Carter for coming out. I want to thank uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out on a rainy evening. I'm sure on a Wednesday night, there's lots of other things to be doing, but this is important. It's important for the community. It's important for our team, and uh, so I'm I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, what I'm going to try to do tonight is is walk everyone through what it is that we're trying to accomplish and why. Uh, and, and really lay out what our team's vision is for this development. Uh, so, now let's see if the last piece of technology works, and yep. it does. All right, so the first thing we gotta talk about is who is the team? Uh, this is, uh, you know, the, I, so, sometimes there's articles written and my name gets, uh, gets used in the article. There are a lot of people on this team. This is uh, a snapshot of some of, the, some of the major companies that are working with us and many of them are here today. So what I'm gonna do is go through and just briefly ask everyone to stand, uh, stand and wave, but I wanna make sure everybody uh, in the community knows that the people who are working on this project care about this project. This is, this is more than just an opportunity to make money. Everybody's aware that if we can successfully redevelop and reimagine Redbird, it's going to have an impact on the community. It's going to have an impact on the city. So uh, I want to start with Terrence Maiden of Corinth Properties. Uh, Terrence, uh, Terrence is my, my primary partner uh, in this deal day to day. He's a developer from Oak Cliff, uh, went, to, uh, went to Carter High School, earned a scholarship uh, to TCU, came back to the community, and he's been doing development ever since. He's a perfect, perfect partner on this. Uh, the team from OmniPlan. I'll talk a little bit more about OmniPlan and and, uh, and who they are and what they do, but they're the primary architects uh, on the deal. The team from Kimley Horn, the aforementioned civil engineers. Uh, we got Trelane Map of Source Building. Uh, Trelane is building that beautiful Starbucks outside uh, that uh, you, that you probably drove by uh, and have uh, and and you'll be able to get some coffee in probably in June. Uh, Mr. John Proctor. Uh, just demolish. Come on, you got to stand, John. There we go. Uh, they uh, they uh, just uh, did a demo of uh, one of the buildings on Westmoreland to make way uh, for some of the other the other projects. Uh, Willis Johnson and the team from JBJ uh, standing in the corner. Uh, integral parts of the team. Tilly Borchers from Civitas, uh, integral part of the financing uh, of uh, of the deal, and also going to be involved uh, with the. Uh, with the uh, the hotel that we're going to be talking about, are there any members of uh, of uh, of the team that I oh Travis Shep oh don't worry uh, he, he's going to get his own introduction don't you worry uh, Travis Sheffield please uh, so Travis is with NRP they're going to be uh, developing the residential uh, the residential aspect of this development so we've got a terrific team it's a broad team. It's a community-based team, and the one thing that everyone on this team has in common is excellence. That you're going to hear me say over and over and over tonight that this is about quality. Um, I know that sometimes in this community, uh, the, the highest quality is not served up. That is not what we're about. And here's the anecdote I was going to tell you about OmniPlan. When I was out there selecting architects, we met with a bunch of different architects. And the reason OmniPlan was selected for two reasons. The first is they've done mall redevelopments all over the country. What's going on with Redbird Mall is not, is not unique. Malls are dying all over the country. OmniPlan is a leader in the nation in redeveloping malls. So is Corinth, by the way. But the thing that really got me was that when I looked at the projects they've done, they did the North Park expansion and they did the renovation of Highland Park Village. And I was looking for a way to demonstrate to the community that we are only going to do the best here. And the way I look at it is, if it's good enough for North Park, it's good enough for Redbird. And so OmniPlan, just both in terms of, of, of substance and form, seemed like the perfect partners, and they've been terrific. They've been involved really since day one. Um, 
Now, I want to I want to uh, recognize a couple other people who are out here tonight that are integral members of the team. So, uh, we haven't we haven't publicized it too much, but there's actually a fairly broad ownership group of this of this uh, of this project. Um, and it was very important to me to have partners who could add value. I wanted to have a diverse set of partners um, who could who brought different skill sets to the table and also who, re who represented the community that we're trying to serve. Three of them have been nice enough to come out tonight. I want to introduce them and, and ask them to come up and just introduce themselves and say a couple of words and then we'll get back onto the presentation. So Roland Parrish uh, is, is here, if, you, if you'd come up, and Randy Bowman and Jill Lewis are here. Uh, I've asked Roland and, and, uh, and, and Randy and Jill just to come up, introduce themselves, talk about why they invested, but they've invested real money uh, they own a significant portion of this uh, of this development, uh, and it's really, really an important aspect of the development that, as there there are profits, because we want there to be profits, uh, it, it it's not all flowing out of the community; it's, it, it's staying in the community. So, would you guys mind coming up and just saying a few words? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good evening. Good evening. So we were asked to come up and say something about why it is that we made the investment. And so I'll tell you, it was, it was not a hard call. For far too long, I feel as if the city has perhaps inadvertently uh, not properly respected the consumptive power of the neighborhoods and families that surround this mall. We have a ton of respect for and confidence in those communities and families that surround this mall. As a city, we tend to target this area with our political capital when it's campaign season. We never miss this community when we're trying to get votes. But when it comes down to time to make an investment to improve the level of amenities that are available to the people who live around this mall, we tend to not be able to find this area. And so we wanted to make an investment in this area so that we could put our money behind our convictions and say we believe in the consumptive power of the neighborhoods that live here and we want to increase the amenities that they have. We heard a couple of things when we would talk to people about the interest we had in making this investment. One was that Redbird is dead. The second was that malls are dead. Well, Redbird's not dead. We just walk through a mall and you see a lot of commerce happening out there. The other thing is, I don't know if other malls are dead or not, and that's really not my issue. My real notion, though, is this. We're investing in Redbird, not as you see it now, but in Redbird reimagined. And the bottom line is that we're investing in the zone of commerce. If we bring here the kinds of amenities that will enhance the lifestyles of the neighborhoods that surround it, we will have more business than we can handle. The goal is to have the neighborhoods that are surrounding this area look to Redbird and say, you know, this is as good as if I lived close to the village on the parkway. Everything that I'm looking to, to do and to consume is within a few miles of my home. If we do that, we would have done our jobs. Hold us to it. We look forward to being a part of this. Thank you. Um, first, uh, Councilman Atkins, thank you so much for putting this together. He's really tenacious. Tenel is tenacious about making things happen in the community. Real briefly, if you don't know me, I, I have some hamburger stands. I moved here in 1989. I'm a McDonald's franchisee. And I built my first restaurant in Pleasant Grove, uh, Horn Freeway. And since then, uh, I'm, to me, I would like for people to know, if I take a biblical uh, stance of Pastor Carter and any other ministers in the house, Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. So I started with that one restaurant. People remember me, I have a paper hat on, uh, apron, uh, unloading trucks mopping the floor. And so God has blessed me. I've had as many as 27 restaurants, McDonald's restaurants. I have 25 right now. Nine of them were built in the inner city, new construction. So I know about black economics. There's a book by Maggie Anderson called Our Black Year. And you, you alluded to that, uh, Councilman Atkins. $100 spent retail in a community. If it's spent in the Anglo community, it will evolve 15 days before it leaves in a Jewish community 20 days before it leaves. $100 spent in an Asian community will stay in that community and evolve for 30 days before it leaves the community. In an African American community, six hours. Wow. Six hours. So, 
to me, I put my money in the community. I've talked about those restaurants that I built. Um, I support the African American Museum, the churches, the schools, Carter High School, Lincoln High School, things I could do, and I give scholarships. What I like about this, when I first moved here, if you guys remember Upper McKinney Avenue, how it looked maybe in like 1989, and how it looks now with all the restaurants, that's what this is, the mixed use development. When I tell my children, they're not interested in the hamburger stands, I'm in the light rail, they're not interested in that, but when I said, I'm, a, I'm an investor in Redbird Mall, they spark. They shop, they're like in their 20s and 30s now. They remember shopping here when they came up. I pass here every night when I come home and in the mornings when I leave. So I want to make this go and grow. I want to make it go and grow. So hopefully, whatever you need to do as a community, we can invest and let's try to uplift Redbird Mall. Thank you. Happen without a team effort. And the city's part of that team, the community's part of that team, all the people sitting here are part of the team uh, that, that uh, who are on this chart. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go and talk about what we're trying to accomplish. This is an investment. It's a for-profit investment, and it's a for-profit investment because we believe that, just as Randy said, the market does not understand this area. So the investment thesis, if I can boil it down, is just what Randy said. People here, Southern Dallas, and when I'm talking about people, I'm talking about bankers, investors, retailers, the people with the money, the people with the goods. They hear Southern Dallas and they think, okay, well, this is Southern Dallas. That's the housing stock and that's the recreational activity. It's totally stereotyped. It's painted with a broad brush and it's way, way, way oversimplified and way over negative. They don't think of that. That's in Elder Oaks, that's Keith Park. They don't think about the families with money, hard-earned income, disposable income, who want exactly the same things as people in North Dallas. The only difference is they want to live in this community and they want to shop in this community. But right now, if they want to shop for the quality that they desire, they have to go elsewhere. And so the whole investment thesis is, if you build it, they will come. If we provide the quality that the community wants, and we've spent a lot of time talking to the community about what that is, if we provide the quality the community wants, it will be successful. The other way, the other way I look at it, sorry for the shaking, I don't know what, uh, what the deal is, but I'm afraid to touch it. Um, if, we, uh, if, 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 you, or if you're talking to someone in North Dallas, there's just, with many, many people, there's just a lack of understanding about the nuances of the different parts of Southern Dallas. So there's a news story, something negative happens in Fair Park, it's on the news. Not only does that give Fair Park a bad reputation, it gives Redbird a reputation, a bad reputation. Why? Because it's all South Dallas. Nobody understands what South Dallas is, that there's a difference between South Dallas and Southern Dallas. They don't even, people don't really understand that that's more than 10 miles from here. It's just an illustration of the oversimplified understanding of this community, and that creates the opportunity. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through this slide because everybody here knows the Redbird history, and if you didn't before, you do now after the councilman's, uh, the councilman's presentation. But, but the key point I wanna make here is that for the last 20 years, for the last 20 years, um, this, this mall has been owned by people from out of town, and it's been a milking strategy. I have to interrupt myself for one moment. I neglected to introduce a key member of the team representing the entire management team that runs this mall, and that's Ms. Edna Pemberton. I apologize, Mr. Pemberton. Sometimes the people closest to us are the ones that we overlook. I apologize. Ed, uh, Ms. Pemberton, Lisa Long, Joan Jones, they run this mall on a day-to-day basis. Ms. Pemberton is in charge of community outreach. She's kept it alive. I didn't realize you yes, physically Lord. guarded the lights. Yes. Uh, you learn something new every day. Lisa Long's been the general manager for 10 years. She does a fabulous job. But even under that ownership, her instructions were maximize profits, let's get that money back up to New York. That's where the owners lived. We have a totally different strategy. We are reinvesting. We've owned this mall now for over two years and have not taken out one penny. Every penny of profit, and this mall is profitable, 
every penny of profit has been gone back into this mall, uh, either in doing small capital projects that we've been doing, but mostly investing in all of the outrageous fees that all of these people charge to be part of the team so that we can plan for the future. So this is a redevelopment, this is a redevelopment play, right? And the first thing that we did, first decision we made in the redevelopment is that nobody calls it Southwest Center Mall. It is Redbird, right? But it's not going to be Redbird Mall. Why is it not going to be Redbird Mall? Because malls are dying. Uh, most of you probably didn't do your Christmas shopping at Macy's. You probably did it in bed on your laptops and on Amazon. I know I did. Malls are dying. The business model of the mall used to be that Macy's and JCPenney and Dillard's and Sears would have big marketing budgets. They'd put big ads in the paper when people read the paper. They put ads on TV, they would drive traffic to their stores, and then after you got finished at Macy's, you came into the food court, you came bought some sunglasses, you did what you did at Redbird Mall. Well, nobody's going to those stores anymore, so malls have to reinvent themselves, and it's exactly what uh, Councilman Atkins was talking about with the ULI study, mixed use, and that's what we're gonna do. The new anchors of malls, of shopping, are not Macy's and JCPenney and Dillard's, it's housing, it's office, it's medical, it's restaurants, entertainment, it's green space, it's things that you can't do on Amazon. There's a reason, you have to provide people with a reason to come to the site, and when they come to the site, then they shop. And so that's what we're gonna do. We are going to turn this mall into a mixed use development. Now we're not gonna knock it down, we're not gonna knock it down because there are some great spaces in this mall, like that center court, underutilized, but you can't reproduce that today for anything that's, that's even close to cost effective. And frankly, we're not gonna get the rents, at least initially, that justify brand new construction. So we're gonna do adaptive reuse. We're gonna take these good bones and we're gonna breathe new life into them with new functions, new uses, new materials, a new look, and new anchors that drive people to this site. So I want to address the elephant in the room. That's, that's the G word, gentrification. There is fear in every community where something like this is going on that it is going to be a gentrifying force. I want to take a minute and define what we think of as gentrification and make it very clear that this is not a gentrifying project. Okay. What are the two things that people are worried about? Well, I look, I look at what happened in West Dallas, what's happening in West Dallas. The first fear is displacement. You build all this great stuff, but it's not for the people in this community. It's, it's built for other people to come into the community. And that's what's happened in West Dallas. All of a sudden, West Dallas, after all these years, people who live in the north are like, oh, it's really convenient to downtown. I'm gonna go eat there, then I'm gonna go live there, and the people who've been there for decades, they can't afford it anymore. The second is higher property taxes, people worrying about getting priced out. So, first of all, I wanna be very clear. We are seeking to meet an unmet demand in this community. We have had, I don't know how many community meetings and there's plenty of demographic studies to show it, and you don't need the demographic studies because you know it. People in this community have plenty of money. They desire quality. They understand quality. They deserve quality. They can afford quality. It's just not here. It's at North Park. It's at the parks at Arlington. It's at Town East. It's at, up, it's at uh, Hillside in, in Cedar Hill. We want to provide that quality in this community. Our target audience is this community. People, people my friends, I live, I live uh, in North Dallas, and some of my friends always say, how are you gonna get people to go down there? And I keep saying, I'm not trying to get anyone to go down there. There's already a lot of people there, and they have a lot of money. They just have to travel too far to spend it. Um, the second difference is that this is a mall. We're not redeveloping an entire neighborhood of houses. This was a center of shopping commerce and it will continue to be a center of shopping commerce. And the only difference is that the range of products that are gonna be sold here are going to be a, a broader range 
with, with more quality uh, products so that everyone in this room who may or may not shop here now will, will want to come here to shop. Um, the other thing is we're aware, you know, this is a community that has a lot of people with money. It also has a lot of people with needs. And so we're trying to be very, very intentional in our development to make sure that this becomes a, an opportunity for people in the community to rise up along with the development. So how does that work? We, we are going to uh, create a workforce development center uh, on the second floor of the mall. Now, I don't know anything about workforce development. I don't want to start a new workforce development agency, but there are plenty of workforce development agencies that could, that could be here to provide resources. The Starbucks that we're building out front, you can get your $5 cup of coffee there, but there is also, uh, they're gonna be training 100 people a year to, to, to go through a training program to get a Starbucks customer service certification, okay? So it's, it's really about being intentional to serve the entire community, and we, are, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. The last point on property taxes is, if we're incredibly successful and people want to be in this community more because it's more convenient, property taxes may go up. First of all, they go up very slowly over a very, very long period of time. The second thing is, if you're a homeowner, that means that you just got wealthier, it means your home is increasing in value. At the end of the day, the only reason the city invests in projects like this is because they want property taxes to go up. So they will rise over time if we're successful, but it's not an overnight thing. It takes, you know, decades for it really to, to seep into the property taxes. So it is not our goal to gentrify. It is our goal to serve this community and meet unmet needs. Now, the other thing that I hear a lot is I've heard this before. I've been hearing about the redevelopment of this mall for years. Why now? Why is it real? And I, and I think this map tells the story. The councilman talked about this a little bit. It's not widely understood, but until uh, our ownership group got involved, that was the ownership map of this site. Every color is a different owner. So the inline portion of the mall where we are now was owned by one group. The Macy's was owned separately, the Sears was owned separately, the Burlington, the Dillard's, the JCPenney, and every parcel outside the Ring Road, road owned separately. So you can't do anything if you don't own more than just one of those parcels. In, in 2015, in September, when we first bought the mall, all we bought was that green X down the middle, where it's kind of like a Y with a little sliver. That's it. And the risk we took was that we would be able to gather up the rest of the parcel like the ULI study suggested. That's what we own today. It's 78 contiguous acres. It's not the whole thing. We don't need the whole thing. It's enough to create a new environment and change the story of Redbird. So that is a big, big difference. Big, big difference. And it was hard work. That was 10 separate transactions with 10 different owners negotiating a price, negotiating the contract, raising the financing, getting and getting it all done. Um, that, that took two years. Um, but now the table is set and we're ready to go. The other reason why now uh, and why this location, this is a great location. I mean, it is the exact mirror image of the Galleria, and there's no one arguing that the Galleria is not a great, great, uh, a great uh, location. It's at LBJ in the tollway. We're at LBJ in 67. Now, we have had some access problems, right? We have had some access problems, but you just heard a presentation from TxDOT that they're putting that exit on 67. That's going to solve the problem coming from the south. It also solves the I-20 problem, because you'll be able to get off I-20 on the 67 and not go all the way up to Redbird Lane. You're going to get right off of Camp Wisdom. And while it's not part of the Southern Gateway project, we are also talking to TxDOT about adding exits so that you will eventually be able to get, uh, you'll be able to access them all from Westmoreland. So that's, that's further off in the future, but they are addressing the, the access problem. So that's another reason why. 
Um, also, the sub, you know, the suburbs are well to do. Oak Cliff has plenty of money. With I-20 cleared up, you can draw from all over. So, the, the stars are aligning for this to happen. Now, why is this a great, a great look? Another reason it's a great location. All the things you already know. The demographics are good. I still think those numbers are understated, but the demographics are good. There's plenty of purchasing power in this community. And there are also plenty of people who may not live here, but they come here every Sunday and Wednesday and probably multiple times throughout the week because there's a lot of churches around here and they draw from all over the Metroplex. They're Amen. all within two miles. And I don't know about you, but in most parts of town, when people go to church, what do they want to do afterwards? <laughs> Eat, shop, spend time with their family. Same thing here. Where do people go to do that? Not Redbird. We want to change that. We think that's a whole other audience of people, plus all of the students. If you go up and down Camp Wisdom, you got UNT Dallas. That's going to be 5,000 students. Paul Quinn College, DBU, Mountain View, Cedar Valley. There's lots of students. They also want things, nice things. And then finally, what we've been talking about the whole time. No Starbucks, no freestanding Starbucks in the area. No movie theaters in the area. You got 208 square miles of Dallas City and one movie theater. And it just opened a couple of years ago and it's barely in Southern Dallas. It's, it's the Alamo Draft House. It's, you can almost spit to I-30 from the Alamo Draft House. So there's a wide open market here. Lots of demand, very little supply. This, that's, a, that's a good formula for success. Now we've talked, a, oops, pardon me. Uh, we've talked a lot about the city of Dallas and the role that they need to play. They have been great partners so far. Councilman Atkins has been a terrific partner. The mayor has been a terrific partner. Police Chief Brown, former police chief, has, was a terrific partner. He's the one that, uh, that, that opened up the, uh, the community outreach center in the mall. Uh, Councilman Thomas, TxDOT. There have been a, there's been a lot of partnership because guess what? This isn't easy. We are fighting decades of reputation and perception. When I met with, with David, with, uh, with Chief Brown, he said, what can I do to help? I want this mall to succeed. And I said, you know, we don't have a crime problem here. We have the safest mall in the Metroplex, lowest crime rate, but that's not the perception. And he said, perceptions are harder to fix than real problems. Hmm. And it's true. So we are fighting the perceptions of this community, and that's why it takes all hands on deck, including the city. We are genuine in our commitment to this community. Um, you don't have to believe the words. At this point, two years in, we've got actions. We are totally committed to minority businesses. We are totally committed to local African-American owned businesses. Uh, the first two construction projects we've done have gone to local African-American owned businesses. And not because we're trying that hard. They were the best, but we want to make sure people have the opportunity. We're spending a lot of time and money getting the word out so that people know of the opportunities well in advance and can prepare for them. Uh, we talked about the, the broad ownership group um, and just meeting, meeting with and listening to the community. Um, we've gotten some of our best ideas from the community. So what have we gotten done so far? Some of these, uh, many of these came from the community. So we have a Marriott Courtyard that, that has agreed to come. Uh, they'll be uh, on, uh, on I-20, uh, right across from where the old Bally's was. Right now it's just a piece of grass. Uh, that's very, very exciting. There is a lack of quality hotels. I've heard it from the pastors. I've heard it from members, members of the community that when they have friends and family in, in town or when there's a convention, they gotta stay at the Omni, they gotta stay at the Nilo. There's not any real any place. There's not enough good places uh, for, for folks to stay. The deck. This is going to be our first office tenant. I believe they're going to be starting construction on their space here in the next in the next 45 days. Uh, this is a an incubator space. This was straight out of a community meeting. What do you need? 
and, and, and we, there were about five meetings in a row where somebody said, there's a lot of entrepreneurship in this community. We need supports, we need nurturing. Uh, there's, uh, there's incubator spaces all over North Dallas, why not here? The DEC is the premier incubator space. Uh, uh, it's a nonprofit, but I'll call it a company. Uh, in the Metroplex, they're opening one right here in Redbird on the second floor. Everybody knows about the Starbucks. Why is Starbucks such a big deal? One opens in North Dallas you know, every other week because one doesn't open in Southern Dallas every other week. It is a big deal. And what's so exciting about it is how into it the Starbucks team is. They believe that this is going to be an incredibly successful store. And then finally, we're going to be turning the second floor of the mall into offices. We're going to be working to attract a major corporate tenant uh, to bring some of their, some of their office uh, jobs to the community, uh, to this community. And we got a really a best-in-class office broker to represent us, JLL. That was a coup, because these guys work on commission. They don't land a tenant, they don't get paid. So they're choosy about who they want to work with. They wanted to work with us, and they're a marquee brand, they're a marquee name. So that was a big deal for us. So what does all this look like? Let me walk you through this for a sec. Um, let me see if this pointer works. Oh, it does, okay. So that is the mall. You'll notice that part of the mall is missing, the food court. We are gonna knock down the food court. Why are we gonna knock down the food court? We don't need that much retail space, and we want to reincorporate this, uh, we wanna reincorporate this parcel into the city grid. People want walkable. They want, um, they want more, more of an urban feel, less suburban sprawl. So we're gonna continue Pastor Bay, we're gonna continue, I'm just gonna point. Um, we're gonna continue Pastor Bailey Drive, and it's gonna go east-west through the development and then Delray uh, from across the street is going to continue and it's going to become the major north-south thoroughfare. In order to do that we have to regrade the entire site. So you may have never paid attention to it, I know I never did before, but if you go to the different mall entrances they're all on different floors. Some of the entrances are on the first floor, the food courts on the second floor. Why'd they do that? Because back in the day when there were stores everywhere, they wanted the traffic even throughout the whole mall so they could charge the same rent on the second floor as the first floor because it was right by an entrance. That made a lot of sense. Doesn't make a lot of sense if you want to have a walkable environment because it means there are these hills in the middle of the development. That's why the J.C. Penney site, it looks like such a valley. There's these two you know, fake hills that they put in there to create the second story entrances by the food court and, and in the back. So we're gonna regrade that whole site. We're gonna make it all one level so that all the retail entrances are on the first floor and people can walk. They can walk along the street. We can put walking trails in. We can have a park. And it, it all in order to do that, it all has to be regraded. The hotel is at the top. That's at the very end of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of that street. Um, this over here off of Westmoreland is our vision uh, for the residential. What are we talking about with residential? In the first phase, we're talking about apartments. Apartments has a lot of connotations. We're not talking about low quality apartments. We're talking about high quality apartments. I was just talking today. I'm involved with KIPP, the charter school group that's across the street. We were at a ribbon cutting for our Pleasant Grove campus, and there's a woman there who, um, who works at KIPP, and uh, she was telling me, I'm so excited about those apartments. I want to live in this community, but I don't want to live. I want to live in a, you know, a nice apartment, and there aren't high-quality multifamily residences in this area. It's either you own your home or you're in Section 8 housing. So this is meeting a demand of people who are from this community who just don't want to mow their lawn anymore, um, and they, but they want to live in, in quality. Um, so that's the new, oh, and then of course out front. We want to put a one acre park and surround it with restaurants. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. I love Papa Do's, I'm tired of Papa Do's. I would like to have somewhere else to go for a nice meal. Willis calls it destination date night. So we want to have a, a pavilion of restaurants on a park to create that invite, to create an inviting environment for people to dine. 
The first floor will remain retail. The second floor will be office. The Dillard's we are trying to turn into a medical facility, um, not uh, not a dock in the box or a, or an emergency room, but a real 75,000 square feet major hospital presence with oncology uh, or orthopedics, cardiology, specialty clinics here in this community. So. We're here to talk about two things. One is zoning and one is financial support. The zoning is real easy. Right now, everything on that chart we could do except residential. We want to change to the MU2 because we think residential is in, in need in the community and it's important anchor for the development. Um, that's really what our goal, our goal is with the zoning. It's not going to change the character of what we're doing. Uh, it's going to allow us to add the residential. Why We're asking for a lot of money from the city to help us with this. And that money, we're asking for it to be used for infrastructure. I described already, we got to re-level the whole site. we got to build two streets. Uh, you heard one of the speakers earlier talk about uh, Dallas Ordinance. If you touch the parking lot, and there is infrastructure underground that's old, over 40 years old, you got to put in all new infrastructure, all new sewer, water. That's very expensive. It adds up. And the fact of the matter is, because of the perception problem, there are not bankers or investors that are lining up, dying to invest in the dream. Right? That, just is, that, that may happen in North Dallas, where there's a lot of different comparable companies for them to look to. But when I have people say to me, hey, show me all the high-end apartments in this area that have been successful, I can't. Show me all the offices, the Class A office space in this area that have been successful. No one's tried. Okay, show me a brand new medical facility that's been successful. No one's tried. How about high-end restaurants? No one's tried. Um, and I'm using the word high-end a lot. I'm not, not that everything's gonna be super expensive, but we're talking about a certain quality level, right, that's above fast food. Um, the lack of comparables makes it a tough, tough investment for bankers. And so in order for this to happen, the city has to pitch in because we won't get the rents that we need to justify the investments we want to make to provide the quality that you all are demanding. And so that's really how the economics work. Um, I was going to say something else that it just flew out of my head. Oh, I remember. Terrence and I were at a meeting the other day. We have a whole marketing center upstairs. We invite in potential tenants. It's, it's got all the pretty images and it just displays the vision. We show that video we were showing earlier. And this guy was from a major retailer that would do fantastic here. And he looked at the vision, he heard what Terrence had to say, heard what I had to say, and he said, we would do fantastic here. You know what? We'd like to be fifth. We'd like to be your fifth user of the site. When you've got four other people who've agreed to do with it, and we know that it's really happening, then we'll come. Well, when everybody wants to be fifth, and no one wants to go first, nothing happens. And so guess what? We went first. We've collectively invested millions of dollars, millions of dollars of personal dollars. Some of the banks, some of our banking partners have invested millions of dollars to go first. We've gotten this far. We've gotten control of the site. We've gotten the vision down. We were starting to get to make progress. We've gotten the Starbucks. They went first. And for that, they deserve, they got a, they, they deserve a lot, a lot of, of praise and gratitude because it's not easy to be first, but they did it. Now we're asking the city to go second because we need to start moving dirt we need to start showing people that this is real. This is really happening. When people start seeing dirt, when they see it with their own eyes, then they'll believe. And until then, they're just gonna wanna go fifth. And so that's why we put in this ask of the city. It's based on, it's based on 
making sure the rest of the deal is financeable, making sure that there's a, a reasonable return for investors, not, a, not quite a market return, but a reasonable return, and most of all, it's to get the ball rolling, right? We go first, they go second, and all of a sudden, the guys that want to go fifth go third, and it happens. So that's, that's our presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Yes, sir. Peter, when you mentioned the 25 million, you said that's a lot of money. Can you give the folks in the room some other projects in wealthier parts of the city that get more than 25 million? Or can we, uh, the, 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 yeah, yeah. The, 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 the council will do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's, not, that's the norm. It, it, it's, it's, it's below average. Well, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Uh, we talk about a TIF, and many people don't know what a TIF is. Um, we talk about West Dallas. Let's take West Dallas, for example. Uh, Murga Airlines Center was part of a TIF, and we could have closed that TIF out. That money from the TIF stay in the TIF fund. It do not go to the general fund to pay for your streets, the road, where they stay there. <clears throat> so developers say, you know what, I want to do something in West Dallas. And it might cost 25, 30 million dollars for infrastructure. That money will come from that TIF of America Airlines Center to do that. This project right at 25 million, paying the butt. We do 40 million. We do 80 million. Downtown, you look at um, um, uptown, look at city place, 45 million infrastructure, 50 million infrastructure. It's your money, but it's do not go to the general fund. Let me tell you about the TIF. A Merger Airline, some of them, a good example, the county put their tax money back into the TIF. The city put their money back in the till. But guess who make money? DISD. They get the benefit. About a billion dollars go to DISD. So when we form TIF, DISD benefit. So make sure you know public school benefit because they do not be part of a TIF. Because they don't participate. When the property tax go up, they keep their money. The city put it back in. We reinvest in there. So the only way that this can work, the ULI study said, hey, you have to form a TIF. If you don't form a TIF, it's not going to work because that's the only tool that the city has to help your community. That's the only tool in the toolbox to do an infrastructure. But guess what? If he don't do his job, guess what? He don't get reimbursed. He don't get his money. But guess what we get? We get all the benefit. So some people start TIF and do not finish. If you don't finish, good for the city of Dallas because he loses money. <laughs> <laughs> and we get the infrastructure and someone else take over. We don't want that. We don't want that. Um, you know, the, 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 key, the key point is really the, is really the first point, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually quoting, uh, quoting the councilman because he, he, was, he and I met yesterday and we were just talking about it. The question isn't why should the city invest in this project? The question is why haven't they until now? Now, there have been a lot of reasons. It really hasn't been viable until we got the land put together, but it's viable now. We've got a first-class team, we've got a first-class vision, we've got a commitment to the community, we've got a good rolling head start, we've got everything in place for it to work. Now we need the partnership of the city in order to really make it a reality. And, and as Roland pointed out, we are hardly unique. Valley View's got a TIF, Uptown happened with a TIF, Downtown happened with a TIF, because it's hard for people to believe if they haven't seen it, so sometimes the city has to step in. The, different, the difference here is that I think there is so much perception problem here that we really need the city to be in on the front end to help get the ball rolling. Because sometimes you can finance a TIF. You can say, oh, there's a TIF. So bank, lend me the money and I'll, and I'll pay you back from the TIF. That won't happen here because there's doubt. And where there's doubt, it becomes paralyzing. Yes, ma'am. Nice to see you. What we're we'll gonna do on February 28th?
One o'clock. One o'clock. Okay. If you cannot go, write a letter to me, an uh, email to my office and said, I do support this program. Oh. This is zoning. 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 Okay. zoning. zoning. We can do that. Please, just do that because number one, it's very important. It's your money. <laughs> it's your community. And if you said that, hey, Councilman Atkins, I do support the zoning change, let us know, so I let my colleagues know, let everyone else, that we, the community, do support the zoning change. And you need to do it. If you can't, you can't show, just, uh, Maria, you got everybody the email address, everybody sign in, we will call you and give you information. Uh, you can take my number down. The office number is 214-670-4066. If you sign in, I'll make sure Maria will call you to make sure that I will get your email from you no later than Friday before 5 o'clock. <laughs> so it's on this one. Hold on. Did everyone get a sheet like this? No. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get a sheet, Maria, you got a sheet left? Kendra took the sheet. So, so therefore, if you sign in, we will call you and give an email address. Please, please, if you support the project, just send a letter and say, yes, I support this on the chain. Anything else? Uh, yes, sir. In the community, they're often talking about the food desert. Yes. How the, this whole development, everything, how other besides the restaurants, how else will that be addressed, such as supermarkets uh, bringing in the, the good food, the quality quote unquote food that we in this community who live here want? Okay. We were talking about food deals before I left City Hall. There was a food deals in Highland Hill right there on Bonneville and Central Stewart. So before I left, we asked everyone to come. Kroger, we asked everyone, would you please come? Would you please come? So we found, found someone who would come with Save a Lot. We gave them $3 million to come. So we do have $3 million for any grocery store want to come to this neighborhood. We might have to up that money some more, but we are doing whatever we need necessary for them to come. So therefore, it's up to the market. Let me tell you a quick story about market. We are on 67, but we shop south of 67. So all those cars who pass here, go to Kroger's or go to Albertson down there, they not gonna come over here because you going over there. So therefore, we gotta be more creative to get in this area to shop more than here so the people will be here and they will bring more stores. So we gotta be smart in marketing to get people here. That's what Peter was saying in this whole area. We got all the churches here. We gotta be more dense neighborhood. We gotta be a walkable neighborhood. We gotta understand our neighborhood, understand what were the needs we, that we need. And we need to shop in our neighborhood. We don't shop in the neighborhood because we don't have the amenities that we need our neighbors to shop for. So you, the community, you got to demand that, but what you got to do with your dollars, with your investment, in your home, in your property, in your neighborhood.